Thank you everybody for joining this webinar. Today we will focus on the qualification of software tools in compliance with ISO 26262. I am Lavinia Battaglia, the customer service representative here at Boxang, and our speaker is Roberto Bagnara, who is CTO and Chief Scientist at Boxang, other than a very passionate computer science professor at Parma University. Not only, Roberto is also a member of the Mizra C Working Group and of the International Standardization Working Group of the C Programming Language. Before we start, please note that you can write all your questions in the Q&A section on the left of your screen. Of course, you can do so throughout the entire webinar, and then at the end, we will read them and try and reply to as many as we can. All right, then, let's turn this over to Roberto. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, let us start uh, immediately. And uh, let's have a look at the uh, outline of my talk. Uh, I will start with uh, a prologue uh, uh, meant to set the stage. I will then review the topic of tool qualification in general. Then I will talk about tool qualification with ISO 26262. I will spend some word about qualification kits and then I will draw some conclusion. So first an acknowledgement, uh, I owe several slides in this presentation to Marcel Bemster of SolidSense. Thank you, Marcel. Okay, so uh, the question is, do you want to reason in assembly? Do you want to write your program in assembly? Or do you want to write programs in C or C++ and reason uh, about your programs at that level? I guess the answer is we want to write code in C and C++. Um, so this is where uh, tool qualification, as far as this talk uh, is concerned, comes into play. So why do we use uh, uh, C? So uh, we already had a webinar. You can find it uh, on our uh, YouTube channel about the use of C in conjunction with uh, uh, safety-related development. The point is that C usage is pushed by a very strong economic reason, and unrestricted C has also very serious problems, in particular non-definite or underspecified behaviors. Uh, non-definite behaviors are present uh, also in other languages, even in Ada. Uh, there are other uh, high-level languages that are more defined. However, none of those is uh, sufficiently portable, flexible, or efficient enough. So two only sensible choices uh, remain. Stick to Mizra C or C++ and compile C, C++ code to assembly uh, code and read about programs at the source code level or reason about programs at the assembly code level. As I said, we lean on the first possibility because we have tools and we have tools in which we can put reliance. Okay, so tools are badly needed. For example, uh, we uh, could, in principle, manually check uh, uh, Misra C and C compliance. However, this is impractical. And uh, we could also translate manually C and C++ code to assembly, and this is also, of course, something that doesn't make very much sense because it's, uh, the cost is enormous. So tools are needed for this and for many other activities related to the development of embedded systems. The point is, to what extent can the tools be trusted? Okay, so we can only uh, trust the compiler if we have done certain activities on the compiler. We can trust the MISRA checker only if we have done certain activities uh, on the MISRA checker. This is called tool qualification. Okay, so the development of uh, safety critical software is regulated by so called functional safety standards. There are several of them for uh, all uh, industry sectors. And uh, the one uh, which we will focus uh, in this webinar is ISO 26262, which is for the automotive sector. So let's have the first poll now. Which functional safety standards do you know? Which ones uh, have you used in the past? 
not necessarily now. Now we are probably most interested in ISO 26262, but maybe uh, in your previous workplace, you have used other functional safety standards. Okay, so the majority replied ISO 26262, of course. And then we've got a good percentage of IEC 61508 and uh some others says um, IEC 62304, some of them, but really a tiny percentage, uh, yeah, 51 to 8, and all others, 12%. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, as I already said, we badly need tools because uh, uh, the complexity of uh, software development for modern devices uh, is so complex that uh, we have to use tools. And uh, malfunction of the tools may compromise the integrity or fail to detect defects in the application software. This is, of course, a risk. And in order to mitigate it, all functional safety standards prescribe integrity requirements on tools. This is usually called tool qualification. Here is what uh, the uh, ISO 26262 in the version of 2018, which is the latest version, says about uh, tool qualification. So the objective is to create the evidence that the software tool is suitable to be used to support the activities or tasks required by the ISO 26262 series of standards. Okay, so building this confidence is the objective of tool qualification. In the different functional safety standards, uh, uh, the tools are uh, always uh, categorized depending on potential impact of tool failure. So what happens if the tool fails in some way? And uh, depending also on the likeliness such failure is detected. On the tool categorization, the functional safety standards will put requirements on tool development on the tool documentation, on the user skills, so all software team members, including the tool users, and will put requirements on tool qualification methods. Okay, it should be done uh, an important distinction between tools that can introduce defects in the application software. For example, a C or C++ compiler. If the compiler has a defect, it will, unfaithfully translate C or C++ code to assembly code. So the compiled code will not have the same semantics the source code had, so the semantics that hopefully was intended by the programmer. This is one thing, of course, this is more critical than uh, the next possibility, which is the tool can fail to detect defects in the application software. For example, a static analyzer, uh, um, used for uh, checking MISRA C or C++ compliance. Okay, so this cannot uh, introduce itself a defect, but it can fail to detect a defect. Another crucial aspect is the scope of use uh, of the tool. So, for example, let's make uh, the example of a C compiler. Suppose we are ready to manually verify the generated assembly code. Of course, the qualification requirements on the compiler in this case can be softened or eliminated altogether. This is one uh, thing that all functional safety standards have in common when tools are concerned. So the basic idea is that uh, Either you verify the output of the tool or you qualify the tool, okay? If the tool has an impact on the safety related uh, functionalities. Uh, another example, if the MISRA C compliance checker is used to justify the elimination of testing activities, then the qualification requirements are increased, okay? Because uh, not only in this use case, where the tool may fail to, to detect uh, defects, but if you use it to do less of other checking activities, the risk is increased. Okay. And uh, 
Another very important point is that tool qualification can only be performed in the specific context of their actual use, okay? This is because most tools have uh, uh, different uh, uh, functionalities. They provide uh, very different functionalities. So it's not the tool per se that uh, you need to qualify. It depends on the use you make of the tool. And not only this, it depends on where you use the tool, okay? So the dependence on the tool operational environment the fact that uh, a certain tool does the proper job in my own PC is irrelevant with respect to the use uh, in a different operational environment, okay? So uh, the tool qualification is uh, essentially a user um, activity. The tool vendor can, and in some cases must, supply material to simplify tool qualification. However, the functional safety standards allow to qualify a tool for which the vendor doesn't even exist any longer. So this is, of course, possible, even though it is much more expensive. In any case, the final responsibility of the tool choice and of the qualification is with the tool user. And for this reason, and I will uh, uh, return to this point, all bragging about certified tools uh, is simply marketing, no more than marketing, okay? The tool cannot be certified. The tool can be qualified, and this is totally dependent on the use case, how you use the tool, and on the tool operational environment. Where exactly do you use the tool? In which context? software and hardware context and project context. So this is time for the poll number two. Very good. Have you ever qualified a tool? Meaning, uh, have you done it personally or maybe you work it in a group now or in the past where someone did qualify a tool and you uh, watched the activity so you know something about the activity? Okay, so... 17% uh, uh, yes, I worked on that personally. 22% yes, my present or former working group did it. And 64% voted no. Okay. So, good. Let's uh, go on with uh, tool uh, qualification uh, in the context of ISO 26262. So, this is uh, uh, regulated uh, by part eight of this functional safety standard in section 11, which is titled Confidence in the Use of Software Tools. And this section describes the process of tool qualification for a specific use case. Okay, the qualification uh, process comprises several steps. Uh, we will go through each one of those. First is planning of usage. The second is evaluation. The third is qualification methods. Fourth is validation and mitigating action. And the fifth and last one is documentation and review. So let's start with the planning of usage. So in this phase, uh, the user has to determine uh, which tool uh, is uh, uh, to be used, what is the configuration, what is exactly the use case, as I said, Tools normally have many functionalities. For example, a C compiler may have tens, hundreds, or even thousands of compile um, of um, um, common line options. And each of those can influence the uh, generated code. So, uh, Using a compiler with two different set of options are two different uh, use cases. Uh, the tool execution environment be precisely identified. Then uh, the maximum ASIL, so automotive safety integrity level, assigned to the component being developed should be uh, uh, determined. And uh, finally, the qualification method should be determined. So in order to do this, 
One has to provide a description of the tool features and functions. Of course, this will be a selection of the features and a selection of the function. Uh, for the documentation, a tool user manual is, of course, uh, uh, required, but possibly and quite likely a tool safety manual. A tool safety manual is a document that prescribes how to use uh, a tool in a safety-related development. It's not the same thing using a tool uh, in a safety-related development or in ordinary development, okay? For example, most graphical user interfaces are not qualifiable. So in the in uh, uh, safety-related development, at the very end of the project, uh, you have to use uh, uh, command line interfaces, for example. So we'll uh, go back to this point. Uh, you have to provide a description of the tool operational environment, and uh, there should exist a description of the expected tool behavior under anomalous conditions. So, for example, what happens when uh, uh, you run out of uh, memory or when you run out of uh, disk space? Maybe there should be a description of known tool malfunctions. So every tool have issues or uh, errors or deficiency. So this should be described along with the appropriate uh, uh, workarounds. And then uh, the, the last thing you have to provide in the planning of usage, you have to describe the measures you are going to take in order to prevent or detect malfunctions. Okay, so this is basically uh, the planning phase, uh, which is the first thing that should be done, and several points are clarified uh, in the subsequent uh, phases. Then, uh, tool evaluation. According to ISO 26262, um, tool, uh, there is a bug in the slide. So <laughs> the tool confidence level acronym is, of course, TCL and not TD. So the tool confidence level uh, is an abstract representation of the degrees of confidence that, uh, can, uh, that is required in a software tool, so that it can be used for a given use case and on a given operational environment. There are three classes of tool confidence level. TCL1, so low confidence in the fact that the tool is working uh, properly in this use case and in this operational environment. TCL2, medium confidence. TCL3, high confidence. So this uh, confidence uh, level is uh, uh, determined uh, in uh, starting from other two parameters that we now see. One is uh, the tool error detection, which uh, is an abstract representation of the confidence uh, uh, you can put on the fact that you will be able to detect malfunctions of a software tool in your use case and on your operational environment. So the classes are TD1, TD2, and TD3. TD1 is when there is a high degree of confidence that malfunctions will be prevented or detected. Okay, for example, because you check the output of the tool with something that in turn is uh, reliable. Uh, TD2 is a medium degree, so you may detect malfunctions, but not in a systematic way. So you may notice them in a more or less uh, uh, random uh, way because you sometimes examine part of the output. And TD3, there is a low or unknown level of confidence that malfunctions uh, will be uh, detected. So this happens when you don't check uh, the output at all and you don't have other uh, indirect uh, ways of checking that the uh, output is correct. The other parameter is the tool impact, TI. There are two uh, uh, TI classes, uh, and these depend uh, on the uh, uh, fact that uh, a, a tool can introduce or fail to detect an error in a safety-related item. So TI1 means the tool can neither introduce nor fail to detect errors. So basically, 
even if the tool malfunctions, there is no impact. And TI2 is for all the other cases. So there is some impact. So the tool either introduces errors or it fails to detect errors or both. Okay. So once you have uh, the TD and the TI, you can compute according to ISO 26262 the tool confidence level. So basically, if the tool is has no impact, so it is TI1, no impact, or if uh, you have a high degree of confidence that you will detect uh, all the malfunctions of the tool, then you end up with TCL1 and you are done. So this assessment uh, is all you have to do in order to comply with this part of ISO 26262. So the tool qualification is not uh, necessary. However, as soon as you have uh, one of the red, you have uh, TI2 uh, and uh, TD2 uh, or TD3, then the tool confidence level is uh, uh, set accordingly. So for TD2, you are at tool confidence level 2. For TD3, you will end up uh, with uh, tool confidence level 3. Okay. And then depending on the ASIL, on the maximum ASIL that is assigned to the component you are developing, uh, a qualification method uh, uh, can be uh, selected. Okay, so the qualification methods, there are four qualification methods. And uh, there is a table, table four, in section 11 of part eight, uh, we stick to TCL3. So TCL3, it means that uh, uh, we have a TI2 and TD3. The table for TCL2 is uh, similar, even though uh, less confidence is required for the case TCL2. And in any case, we uh, focus here on TCL3. And a plus means that it is uh, recommended. And a double plus means that it is highly recommended. So you want to stick to the highly recommended thing. Let's see what are the four methods. So one is increased confidence from use. So the argument is something like, we have used the tool in the past uh, on uh, uh, other projects, so we are confident the tool works properly. So uh, it's not as easy. So it, it, the thing must be spelled out more precisely. You have, have you, you should have used the tool in exactly the same configuration for exactly the same use case in exactly the same uh, tool operational environment. Then you can say uh, there is increased confidence from use. Another possibility is uh, evaluation of the tool development process. So the tool development process uh, complies to certain requirements. This is uh, acceptable for uh, ASIL A and B, not for ASIL C and D. Uh, the um, third, uh, which is almost universally used for the tools uh, we focus in this talk, which are compilers and the static analyzer, validation of the tools. So validation of the tools means that you run a large number of tests for which you have validated output and you check that the tool is giving the expected output. And the output, of course, should be uh, predicted uh, uh, from the requirements of the tool. The fourth uh, possibility, which is, uh, I don't know, I don't think it has ever been used for the kind of tools I've mentioned is development in accordance with the safety standard, which means uh, you develop the compiler uh, or you develop the static analyzer uh, according to the prescription of uh, ISO 26262 or even another functional safety standard, DO 178C, for example. So this, as far as I know, this has never been used for compilers or static analyzers. Okay. Then uh, let's uh, focus on uh, validation. 
So again, compliance with the functional specification of the tool is uh, tested given the specific use case in the given user tool operational environment and with the precise configuration that is used in production. Okay. Uh, all of you are in the software field, so you know that the fact that the tool works properly with a certain option means nothing about what the tool does with another option. And uh, of course, uh, when uh, you have done this kind of tests, you will find uh, problems. And for each problems you find, you will have to define uh, mitigations. For example, you find that uh, the compiler as uh, um, a defect concerning the compilation of certain uh, complex uh, arithmetic uh, operations. So you will have to make sure that you don't depend on this complex mathematical operation if, uh, if this is the case. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, focus on compiler validation. What are the requirements? It's, uh, the requirement is the ISO, C or C++ language specifications. This is a simplification, of course. So the requirements are in the ISO, uh, in the C, C++ language specification, in the machine code specification, and in other, and in other aspects. Anyway, the requirements uh, are uh, uh, present and are written down. Okay, then you will do compiler testing using a big suite of test programs, and you will make sure that the specifications are complied with by the compiler. Okay, so one might think, uh, why should I qualify the compiler? In the end, I do unit testing. So isn't unit testing enough if the compiler has bugs? I will do the unit testing and I will find the bugs. Uh, this is not true, unfortunately, because uh, of uh, uh, the fact that, uh, for example, having uh, complete coverage, I don't know, even MCDC coverage at the source uh, level doesn't mean having 100% uh, coverage at the assembly level. So your test suite, your unit test suite could be from the point of view of the source code uh, uh, wide enough, large enough. However, when you go to compiled code, your test suite may not exercise several paths in the compiled program. So let's make an example. It is a very simple function written in C. And you can obtain complete coverage at the source level with just one test. So you do one test, f of 1. You see that uh, the condition, uh, the loop will be executed uh, um, once. So this guard uh, will evaluate to true once. It will evaluate to false once. And so we have completed coverage uh, the code uh, with just one test. And uh, if we instruct the compiler not to do any optimization, this is less easy than you might think. So, for example, GCC, even at minus O0, which in theory means uh, don't do any optimization, does some optimization. However, if you switch off all the optimization, you can reach complete coverage of us at assembly level with one test. But as soon as you optimize, now I don't pretend you to read this uh, uh, big chunk of assembly code. So anyway, what the compiler did, uh, it, the compiler did a partial loop unrolling. So it unrolled four iterations. So we'll, uh, uh, if you use just the test f of one, you will not cover even half of the assembly code. So that's why the argument, I don't qualify the compiler because I do unit testing, is not good. Okay, so in order to uh, properly validate a compiler, you need thousands of tests. This is uh, a 
uh, table um, regarding uh, probably not the last version of SuperTest, which is a, a very thorough validation suite uh, produced by SolidSense, which is a Dutch company that specializes precisely on uh, these uh, uh, things. Okay, now uh, enough for uh, compiler uh, validation. Let us uh, uh, talk about the use of static analyzers uh, in uh, ISO 26262. Uh, and this is regulated by part six of uh, this standard. So this table, I will focus on three tables uh, uh, which are in, in this part six of ISO 26262. So a static analysis tool uh, is, uh, can be used in order to enforce uh, low complexity by uh, enforcing thresholds on complexity metrics. Use of language subsets, of course, you know that Misra C is a subset of C and Misra C++ is a subset of C++. Enforcement of strong typing. Strong typing is one of the requirements uh, for Misra C and C++ compliance. Use of defensive implementation techniques. Uh, this also is the subject of uh, Misra guidelines and other guidelines. Use of well-trusted design principle, same thing. Use of unambiguous graphical representation, this is uh, uh, outside the scope of a static analyzer. Use of style guides, for example, bar C. We had a webinar on bar C and you can find it uh, on our YouTube channel. Use of naming conventions, this is also something that is uh, enforceable with uh, a static analyzer. I have uh, uh, added an eclair column here to mark uh, the rows uh, in uh, this uh, table that eclair covers. Then table three, uh, principles for software architectural uh, design. So um, the various row are, uh, cover different uh, topics, uh, appropriate hierarchical structure of software components, uh, uh, restricted size of interfaces, strong cohesion within each software component, and uh, loose coupling between software components, uh, and, and so on. So these are all uh, uh, aspects uh, in which uh, static analysis uh, uh, plays uh, an important uh, an important role, and uh, as such, uh, it's uh, a subject for qualification of the tool that you use to uh, realize them. Uh, uh, final table: uh, design principles for uh, software unit design and implementation. There is a very famous or infamous rule about one entry and one exit point in subprograms and functions. So. Uh, and this uh, is the reason why a certain MISRA rule uh, uh, exists. No dynamic objects, initialization of variables, no multiple uses of variable names. If you want, this is a subset of MISRA C. Okay, so these are um, things that are all uh, uh, that can largely be checked with a static uh, analyzer. So, um, how do you validate a MISRA static analyzer? What are the requirements? The requirements are the language specification, so the ISO language specification, as in the case of the uh, uh, compiler. And of course, uh, you have the MISRA C and C++ specification, which is another part of the requirements. And then you do test. You need a large number of tests to make sure that uh, uh, whenever there is a violation of a certain MISRA guidelines, the tool says uh, there is a violation or there may be a violation and, uh, and so on. So uh, this is how you validate. So not very different from uh, uh, compiler uh, validation. The important difference is that compiler validation is more complex in, 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 in which uh, it requires uh, execution of the generated code. Whereas uh, for um, a MISRA checking tool, you have to inspect uh, 
the messages provided by, you have to check the messages provided by the tool. For uh, a MISRA checker or for a tool that is computing uh, metrics, so for example, the HIS metrics, uh, the important, an important thing is uh, about the tool configuration. This is one of the aspects that very often is uh, not considered with enough attention and that can has the potential of spoiling completely the activity. So in C99, for example, there are 112 implementation defined behaviors. And as each implementation defined behavior can be defined uh, in two or more uh, ways, uh, the number of dialects of the C language is very, very high. So with, uh, even with this uh, quite simplistic uh, analysis, we end up with more than 10 to the power of 36 possible dialects of C. And what's the problem? The problem is that if the, uh, your compiler and uh, your uh, static analyzer refer to a different dialect, the results of static analysis are completely uh, irrelevant uh, to uh, the fact that you, your code is really is MISRA compliant or uh, really has certain values for the metrics. Okay, so the thing is made uh, more uh, problematic by the fact that uh, every given compiler can implement via option several dialects of C. For example, the compiler I'm using on this machine has uh, uh, many, many uh, options uh, and it can easily uh, implement uh, uh, via option 100, more than 100,000 of dialects of C. So, so if the tool, the static analysis tool uh, is not adapted to the particular dialect implemented by that compiler with that set of options, uh, the results uh, are uh, completely unreliable. Okay, it's enough to change one compilation option and you may have, uh, you may end up uh, analyzing uh, the wrong code, for example. I don't know, with GCC, if you, you specify, you activate optimization, a macro called underscore, underscore, optimize, underscore, underscore will be defined and this may be used in a header file and so a different part of the code, source code, could be compiled. And if the tool doesn't take this into account, you will analyze the wrong part of the source code. So we are at uh, the final uh, phase uh, for tool qualification in ISO 26262. Uh, we have to produce uh, a software tool uh, criteria evaluation report. Uh, we have to produce a tool qualification report, and this typically results in updates to the tool safety manual. So uh, during your validation activity, you may have found defects in the tool that, uh, for example, that the vendor didn't uh, detect yet, okay? So, for example, because the, the tool has so many options that uh, nobody ever tested uh, this particular combination of option you are using, okay? And so this will require you to update the tool safety manual. The tool safety manual is usually, is usually produced by the tool vendor and you will have to write, uh, if you have found defects, you will have to find mitigations if you want to use that tool and your mitigation de facto will become a part of the tool safety manual. And uh, uh, sometimes you will always need a confirmation review by an independent party of, the, of the, your tool qualification activities. Okay, uh, let's spend a few words uh, about uh, qualification kit. The qualification kit uh, is uh, uh, something that uh, the tool vendor provides to you in order to uh, facilitate the tool qualification activity. The effect can be enormous. So the difference between uh, uh, qualifying a tool uh, all by yourself and uh, using a well-done qualification kit can be one to two orders of magnitude. So um, 
a, a, a well done uh, uh, qualification kit should contain documentation and uh, documentation templates or documentation you can reuse in order to produce your document. It should contain a tool safety manual. So a tool that doesn't come with a tool safety manual is rather suspicious. So uh, I would uh, be skeptic on the possibility of using such a tool in a safety-related development. Um, the uh, qualification kit should contain validated test suites. So just to give you an idea, this requires thousands of tests for a MISA checker and tens of thousands of tests for a compiler. So um, if you think you have a qualification kit and, and you do not meet these numbers, uh, I would be very skeptic. So in, it's, it's impossible to properly qualify a MISRA checker with just a couple of hundreds of uh, tests. And uh, uh, similarly, it is impossible to properly qualify a compiler if you don't have uh, tens of thousands of tests. A qualification kit should uh, always contemplate the possibility for users to add their own test cases. So the same approach in safety-related development is nobody trusts nobody. So you shouldn't trust your vendor to have uh, uh, provided uh, all the tests uh, you want to make. You are... Um, it, it, it is good that you add your own test. Okay, uh, sometimes this is uh, uh, essential. For example, uh, let's say there is a MISRA rule saying that you shouldn't use uh, uh, compiler extensions, language extension. So if you comply to MISRA C, you will reduce a lot the use of compiler extension. But let's say that you absolutely need a certain compiler extension. Most likely, the qualification suite uh, you uh, will buy will not contain tests, uh, enough tests for this compiler extension you are using in a certain way. So if you want to do a proper job, you will have to add some tests for the compiler extension you are using. Uh, the qualification kit uh, will contain test automation machinery uh, and uh, uh, why this? Because, uh, as I said, uh, you will have thousands to tens of thousands of tests. So it's uh, uh, clearly in, impossible to test them one by one uh, manually. So testing, uh, test automation machinery is required. And this should be supplied in source form for inspection. Again, nobody trusts nobody. You have to have the possibility of testing that the test automation machinery is doing the proper thing. Not only this, you should have the possibility of repeating each test completely independently from the qualification kit. So again, in, uh, uh, in realization of the same principle, you may decide to use, uh, you will of course use the test automation machinery, but just to make sure, you may want to repeat some of the tests uh, in a completely manual way. So um, since uh, uh, last year, Eclair has uh, qualification kits. Uh, for those who don't know, Eclair is our own static analyzer. So it supports uh, all the uh, major functional safety standards. It supports uh, MISRA C 2004, MISRA C 2012, MISRA C++ 2008, and starting from the next uh, uh, version, uh, which will be sometimes in May, uh, it will also support uh, uh, the HIS metrics and the other metrics that are supplied along with the MISRA packages. Uh, the, um, uh, qualifica the CLAIR qualification kits contain thousands of uh, uh, tests developed by uh, Bagseng by ourselves, uh, and they uh, allow to thoroughly validate all the output formats of Eclair that are 
qualifiable and, and this is very important in view of what I've just said, taking into account all relevant implementation, the final aspects of C and C++. There is also support for totally independent validation via the solid sense MISRA C2004 and MISRA C2012 test suites. So these test suites have been developed by a third party, by this company, Solid Sense, which I have already mentioned in this presentation. User, of course, can add their own test cases. There is a test automation unit supplied in source form. As I said, this is an important thing. And uh, the test automation machinery produces detailed reports that allow easily running any test outside from the qualification kit. So as part of the report, uh, you will be given a command that you can copy and paste and rerun exactly the same test in a way that is completely independent from the qualification kit. So the qualification kit contains also lots of documents. This one is instance of uh, it, this one specific Eclair qualification kit. It is for release 3.6.2, which was um, at the end of last year. So there is, of course, uh, a, the Eclair qualification kit user manual that says uh, uh, what, how do you use the kit and how do you translate uh, the activities into the requirements uh, of uh, the functional safety standards. So in this case, it's DO178C. There is a tool safety manual that describes what are the qualified functionalities, what are the qualified output specifications for uh, all the options you can use in safety related development and so on. Then there is a, a manual for the test uh, automation unit. There is another document that can be uh, used. So it's, uh, are the, these are the tool operational requirements uh, uh, prescribed by uh, DO178C. So uh, this is a development for. There, there will be a corresponding user tool operational requirement and the combination of the two will satisfy the requirements uh, of the O178C. Uh, there is also a description of, Eclair de, of the Eclair development process. Uh, so this is sometime a requirement. So uh, here there is a description of how we develop Eclair, which kind of standards uh, do we uh, use, which kind of testing, uh, we do subject uh, Eclair, uh, what are, uh, who decides uh, uh, when to make a release and how is a release validated and so on. Uh, and then two minor documents, the release notes that contain a description of all, all the changes that have been made in the history of uh, uh, Eclair and also the fact report so it's uh, every tool uh, has uh, defects. So when these defects uh, are found, uh, they are, uh, especially if they are found late in the release cycle, they are listed in the clear defect report along with the mitigation. So let me now spend some word about uh, the so-called tool certificate. This is a recurring uh, question. So. Ah, but I would like to have a certificate of is your tool certified? So let me say this very clearly. A tool cannot be certified. A tool can be qualified. Of course, marketing people will write just anything to pretend the contrary. So these are sentences that you can find if you uh, use Google, okay? You will find things like uh, this tool, is usable in ISO 26262 up to AZLD, and AZLD is the maximum safety integrity level, means uh, uh, it's, it's a more uh, stringent uh, set of requirements. So it's for things that can cause uh, fatalities or multiple fatalities. And here is the, the critical point. TCL1 can be reached. What is TCL1? Let, let's go back to the definition of TCL1. So TCL1 means, what is it?
Okay. So TCL1 means that you have either tool impact one, so there is no impact of the tool. If, even if the tool malfunction, it has no impact whatsoever on the safety of the uh, item you are developing. Or you have TD1. TD1 means that you have high probability of detecting the failure. This means practically that you are checking manually or with a properly qualified tool, so you, another tool, you are checking the output. So saying that uh, the tool is uh, qualifiable, you can reach TCL1, it means nothing. So this certificate is worth nothing. You can find also gems, like the tool is certified ISO 9001, and in lesson zero of any ISO 9001 training course, you will learn that ISO 9001 is not for tools. It has nothing to do with the tool. So a tool cannot be certified ISO 9001. So uh, anyway, uh, there is people that is happy to buy certificates. Buying certificates uh, is easy. You just need some money. There is, of course, people that is very willing to sell certificates. However, in the unfortunate case, you end up in court. These kind of things will be demolished in 30 seconds by expert witness. Okay? The judge will charge an expert witness, and it will ask the question, look, uh, was this... What, where are the proper uh, activities being done here? And if the activities were, we just bought a certificate, then this is not good. There is some responsibility in certification agency in this uh, malpractice. So the advice I can give you is these certificates always, because those who award them are clearly uh, uh, cautious uh, somehow, um, the certificate says that uh, the full reports are an integral part of the certificate. So the, the certificate is a, is a nice thing, the first page, and then there are uh, several other pages, tens of pages that explain exactly what has been done. And if you read carefully these pages, you will end up with the conclusion, I have to qualify the tool. Okay, so to conclude, tool qualification is an essential requirement for using tools in safety-related development. In this uh, webinar, we have covered the basis process for ISO 26262, and this is not very different from the process described in other functional safety standards. So if you are interested in other functional safety standards, this uh, webinar gives you some concepts uh, uh, that will facilitate you uh, when you move to another functional safety standard. It's uh, a complex process if done in isolation. Think uh, about uh, the time it could take you to develop thousands or tens of thousands of test cases in order to do qualification all by yourself. So if uh, you use a, a, a good qualification kit, the time uh, and the effort uh, is, of course, uh, reduced, as I said, by one to two order of magnitude. And there are advantages besides checking the box. So some people think about tool qualification. I have just to tick a box. It's, it's not so. So this will allow you to sleep better. You will not sleep better with a tool certificate, but uh, you will sleep better if you have done a proper tool qualification. It will decouple application development from tool testing. So if you have qualified the tool, the compiler, or the static analyzer, you can have confidence in the quality of the tool. You will have developed maybe workarounds for the issues you have identified. And then in the application work, you will not be uh, slowed by issues in the tools. And of course, this will reduce time to market. With a good qualification kit, or at least a good validation suite to, to cite Marcel Bemster, 
um, it is not rocket science. So it's something that can be done. And it's something that uh, in safety related development uh, for developing safety related items shall be done. Okay, thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you, Roberto. Uh, we have several questions. Um, first one, does source code editor need to be qualified for ISO 26262? Okay, so no, because uh, in your use case, you will uh, uh, use the editor while you uh, write the code and you will not delegate to the editor any uh, checking uh, of the code or, or the editor will not compile the code and so on. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, th this question is, is, is very good because it, uh, it gives me the occasion of specifying uh, better what I have just, uh, uh, what I've said uh, before. So a tool, for example, a MISRA checking tool may have a beautiful graphical user interfaces in which you drag and drop, in which you can do all sorts of things. However, this will, for example, for Eclair, this will be based on uh, web technology. Okay, so this thing is not qualifiable. Uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to, uh, as far as I know, to qualify Google Chrome or to qualify Firefox. It's too complex. There is no specification. It's, uh, it's really impossible. What does it mean? That I have to work for the entire duration of the project using the command line? No. It means that for MISRA compliance, for example, in the very final run of the project, the one that will assess that your code does not contain any unjustified uh, uh, deviation from the guidelines, well, this last run should be done in a way specified by the tool safety manual. And typically, the analysis will be done from the command line using a restricted set of options and uh, producing text-only output, okay? So um, I hope to, to, to have clarified this. Uh, during the development, I, I can use uh, all what I want uh, for MISRA checking uh, purposes, but in the very last run, I should stick to the qualifiable functionality of the tool. And this will typically exclude all graphical user interfaces, all fancy outputs, and will uh, stick to uh, reproducible uh, inputs and outputs. Okay, so um, another question. Who is responsible for tool qualification? Is it necessary to perform tool qualification before starting development for functional safety projects? Okay, so these are actually two questions. Who is responsible for tool qualification is the final user. And uh, it's only the final user for several reasons. So the final user is the only one who can assess, uh, who has all the information required, is the only one who knows uh, the criticality of the project uh, uh, he or she is working on, uh, it is the only one that can uh, know exactly what is uh, the use case uh, he or she has in mind. And uh, it is the only one who knows and has access to the tool operational environment. Again, the tool operational environment is a, is a serious thing. So it must be that machine with that operating system, with that patches applied. Okay, all of you is, is in software, so you know very well that uh, something that seems completely unrelated from a failure can be related to a failure. Okay, so this was the first question. It is uh, the final responsibility is uh, with uh, the user. So, and uh, the other question is, is it necessary to perform tool qualification before starting development for functional safety project? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's better to do so. It's better. So in some cases, it is something that you have to negotiate in advance uh, with your customer, okay? So you have to communicate sometimes in advance uh, 
which tool you are uh, planning to use and why, uh, and sorry, and how do you plan to qualify it? Okay. And uh, another reason why it is better, uh, even when it is not required to, pour the, to perform tool qualification before, is that it will save time. So it's not excluded that the result of tool qualification is uh, I cannot use this tool. So, okay, this is rather extreme, but in the end, by the tool qualification activity, you might discover that for your use case in your tool operational environment, the tool is inadequate. You will have to change to another tool, and this is a disaster. This may be a disaster if this happens late in the history of the project. Okay, so another question. How much time would it take to qualify a CLAIR? Um, okay, so in order to qualify a CLAIR, it depends uh, uh, with or without the qualification kit. It also depends, of course, on the functionalities you want, uh, you want to uh, um, qualify. If you want to qualify for use with one coding standard or for more than one coding standard or for the metrics uh, and so on. So if you use the qualification kit, uh, it may take uh, two weeks, I would say, starting from zero. So starting from the very, so two weeks for one person. Uh, if uh, the person is dedicated to qualification starting from the first day, he or she opens the uh, qualification kit manual to the day where uh, he or she has uh, produced the uh, required documentation uh, using uh, what is provided in the qualification kit, maybe two weeks. Uh, without it, uh, it uh, it's really can be enormous. I mean, if you have to develop uh, 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 thousands of test cases and validate them yourself. It may take, I don't know, I don't know, one year, two years, uh, five years. Okay, Berta, sorry, give me a second. I'm trying to read them all. Um, okay, so uh, Roland asks, uh, often there are further tools used after the build process like bean2mod.exe uh, or uh, bean 2 rec have they also been taken into account in a qualification process? Uh, yes. So the principle, the general principle in ISO 26262 and in all functional safety standards is that all tools should be taken into account. So in the easy cases, uh, in, the, in, a, in a typical project, uh, you may use dozens of tools. Okay. So in the uh, easy case, uh, you will do just the first part of the qualification. So the, uh, you will uh, uh, assess uh, the tool impact and uh, the um, malfunction, the error detection uh, potential. And you may discover that you don't need any, any further uh, qualification activity because uh, you end up with uh, tool confidence level one. However, for the tools uh, that uh, are uh, mentioned in the question, bin 2 mod or bin 2 srec this looks like tools that have the potential of inserting a defect in the embedded code. So uh, I guess uh, bin 2 mod and bin 2 srecs are uh, translators from one uh, binary code representation to another binary code representation. So a defect in, in, uh, in these uh, tools uh, may uh, cause the fact that you uh, flash or you upload the, the wrong code. Uh, luckily, they are probably quite simple tools with just a few options or even not no option at all. So qualifying them will not be very difficult because uh, the source language and the uh, target language, I mean, the, the different binary representations for uh, executable code are very simple and, and, and small. And so, however, yes, they, they should, of course, be qualified. And in this case, the, the two examples that have been made have the potential 
of uh, introducing an error in the code that is actually running. Okay, Roberto, I've got one last question, but um, while you reply, I'm going to launch a poll to check whether someone needs more time to formulate their question. So you should be able to see the poll now. And the question is, is the means right exam plus suit uh, any good for validation? Oh, this is easy. Absolutely not. So uh, actually, it was called the Exemplar Suite in MISRA C 2004. Now it is called, for MISRA C 2012, it's called Example Suite. And uh, uh, they are just collections of examples. They are, uh, I would say, one, of, one to two order of magnitudes too small to make any conclusion. And of course, uh, every tool vendor pays extra attention to make sure the tool does well uh, on these examples. But they are uh, very, very small selection of simple examples from which uh, no real conclusion can be made about the suitability of a tool for serious professional use of a MISRA checking tool in a safety related project. Uh, can a tool suite qualified for lower TCL be qualified for higher TCL later? Uh, sure, of course. This can always be done. Uh, of course, uh, the activities uh, may very likely will be different. So you cannot, of course, say um, uh, simply since uh, it was qualified for uh, TCL2, then it is qualified with TCL3. You have to, you can recycle some of the work uh, you did. Uh, you can, of course, uh, establish the relevance of what you already did uh, to uh, uh, what you need to do now. So the activity will have to be uh, redone. Uh, however, uh, uh, of course, uh, you will be much uh, uh, facilitated in uh, in the uh, endeavor. All right. So uh, thank you, Roberta. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Our next webinar is on May 5th, and it's Floating Point Computation Traps and Pitfalls Part 1. Uh, shortly will be followed by Part 2 on May 7th. So make sure uh, you register to both sessions. Uh, maybe we can send you the link in the post-webinar mailing so it's easier if you haven't registered already. Uh, of course, uh, as Roberto mentioned during his presentation, uh, we've got a YouTube channel. So there you will find all previous and future webinars. So if you want to just rewatch something or uh, share them with uh, your colleagues, you can do so there. And uh, I don't know if you have more questions also and you haven't got the time to write them now, you can uh, always drop us an email uh, at info.bugstand.com. So we are signing off now. I hope to see you all next time. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.